So folks, welcome to episode 13 of Brookline's weekly virtual town hall meeting for businesses and nonprofits in Brookline. Of course, brought to you by the Small Business Development Committee. Uh, I am Raul Fernandez, your select board member and also chair of the Small Business Development Committee. Uh, Brookline's businesses and commercial areas looked and felt a bit different this week. Uh, at the start of phase two, I actually had dinner outdoors um, at Public House last night. It was a great experience, thanks to all the folks there. Uh, as we embark on step one of phase two of the state's reopening plan, we're eager to hear about your experience this past week. How has the past week been for you and your business? What are your questions and concerns? And how can the town better help and support you through this difficult time? Uh, before we dive into uh, discussion and Q&A, economic development, it's going to provide a few updates, and then we'll hear from Pat Maloney at the Health Department. Uh, just a note, uh, from my perspective, I'm going to stick around for the first part of our conversation, which, which um, and uh, and then I'll need to sort of just disappear for, for a bit. Uh, we have our big budget meeting uh, tonight and another one on Tuesday, but a really big one tonight for Select Board. Um, we've got some new information that I need to pour through throughout the day, um, so I'm going to need a little time this morning to do that. But I will stick around for a little bit. Uh, but with that said, I'm going to turn it over now to Kara Bruton, your Director of Economic Development. Take it away. Good morning, everybody. I wanted to um, let you know that um, there's been a couple of locations in town that are getting really creative working with um, business owners, private property owners, um, our schools. And so just to give you a couple of examples, um, yesterday I was at a Brookline place in Brookline Village um, with the um, Arts Commission of Brookline and also um, a nearby business <clears throat> to open up that, um, and we were talking with staff from Children's Hospital to open up that private um, grass area now that it's all been finished. Um, and that's going to open up for events as early as July and um, going through August. So it's um, so great to start seeing signs of, you know, planning for socializing, socializing again with each other. Um, and it's very uplifting personally. So I'm excited about um, Brookline Place. Uh, so yesterday, uh, Meredith was on a call with the um, a cap both with the subcommittee of the school committee, um, with um, the owner of Zaftig's, uh, Bob Schumann, and um, they were very supportive, as I understand from Meredith, about um, using the school property. There's now a paved kind of fire lane adjacent to Zaftig's. Um, our fire department immediately said, sure, no problem. Our schools, it looks like, are being very supportive, um, and so they will probably be able to um, get a amended basically restaurant license to make that work. Um, tonight, at Raul's homework that he's reading through, um, after the budget, the select board is going to be taking up the Abbey um, tonight. Um, they are working with the next door spot um, to expand their seating in front of Dunkin' Donuts. Pat Maloney, you might have heard earlier when we were just chatting, was talking about, I think, um, the tavern expanding in front of the hardware store. So businesses are getting really creative. Um, I'm naming all of these things to hopefully get people to think about other ideas. Um, Meredith, Todd, and I are in close contact. We're open to anything. Um, if we just need a specific proposal. There's a couple of themes that are running through um, all proposals. Um, just you know, think about how to meet the state um, the governor's orders for, you know, all of the rules of that comes around food um, preparation and hygiene and, and disinfecting cycles, how that's going to work, um, as well as um, insurance. If it's, if it's on public property, um, just having your own insurance named the town. Um, we're going to be in front of the select board tonight, in addition to the Abbey, talking about kind of more broad actions. It's really exciting that the governor um, made yet another executive order a week or so ago and it really loosened things up at the state level so restaurants usually had to um, if they changed anything <laughs> had to not only go to the select board and change their license but then also if they serve liquor had to have that reviewed by the state agency before being able to change the operations and this sometimes could take months that layer has been removed um, the select board tonight are going to take up um, three, three specific proposals um, that were 
are bring, we're bringing to them with um, health, fire, <laughs> transportation, all the departments working together, um, town council's office. And what we're basically doing is um, asking the select board to streamline everything we possibly can as allowed by state law, which again has been loosened up thanks to the governor. So for example, we're asking that the abutter, certified abutter notification that usually has to happen for restaurants just be eliminated. Um, the governor's order now allows amended licenses to be done with just the town administrator and one select board member rather than a select board public hearing and meeting. So that's going to speed things up. We're asking to suspend all permitting fees related to outdoor customer areas. Um, and we're also kind of asking the select board to, you know, kind of back us up and making a commitment to try to review, um, reduce the review time um, by staff. So the other thing that's kind of neat to watch is how some of these things that we're experiment, experimenting with are going to stay in the long term, not just temporarily. Um, and one small example of that is um, tip certification. If you're not a restaurant, you may not know what that's about, but um, basically it's anybody that serves alcohol has to get this certification. Anytime you have a new manager, you have, as a restaurant, you have to pay for them to go get that certification. It can be very expensive, cumbersome. It can also take a long time. Brookline is one of the last communities to um, still require that that certification class be done in person. Um, and we have had, you know, stories of restaurant owners having to go to Rhode Island or, you know, whatever to try to find a class that happened to be going. Um, those classes are becoming more and more infrequent um, because more and more communities are now allowing that certification class to be online. So um, tonight we're going to bring up the subject with the select board. They will probably not vote on that piece until Tuesday night, um, but we are asking for a permanent change, which the police are supportive of, um, so that TIP certification can now be just online. So that's kind of big picture what's going on. Um, if anybody has any requests, please, um, if, it's an, if it's a new you know, location, um, start with Meredith or I, um, and we'll communicate with Todd. If it's an existing location or just kind of an adjustment, um, just go straight to the um, town, um, sorry, select board office, Tiffany Clark, Tiffany Souza, our licensing clerk, um, and we'll put her email in the chat box. And that's all I have. Pat, did you want to add anything? No, I'll, I'll go over um, some of the details related to the outdoor seating, but that's, um, yeah, we, we are working as a team. The word is out that we're trying to expedite this because uh, our businesses are, are, are hurting and um, this this will be a quick process. Everybody's been very cooperative, all the building, fire, health, uh, to get this moving. So this is on our agenda, top of the list, and we'll be working with everybody to push it through ASAP. Wait, Elias has had his hand up for a, a bit. Elias, do you want to jump in? Oh, hold on. Let's make sure we unmute you. Oh, still on mute. Elias, you still have to unmute. All right. No. Very good. There we go. Hear me? Okay. Uh, I did because as was requested by Raul that uh, the chair, uh, you know, I uh, my business has been doing very, very well, extremely well uh, compared to what we were doing two weeks ago. Um, people start to come out and, uh, and the amazing thing that people respect that social distance and respect the rules we put in place for their safety and our employees' safety, and everyone is doing good. So I'm very happy with that, and hopefully everyone else can report the same. Great. Do we have any more questions about outdoor seating? Any of CARES updates or what the site is we're talking about? Sorry, Meredith, there's one in the Q&A. Um, Jen Mason is asking, about whether the um, loosening of the abutters of the abutter requirement will be for just on-premise liquor licenses, meaning basically restaurants or off-premises, which are what I would call package stores or you know wine stores. Um, we understand that the governor's order and the pending legislation that's um, 
in draft right now is for restaurants only, not for kind of package sales, but I will definitely um, double check that, Jim, with our town council's office um, and just, just triple check and make sure. Um, as far as I know, the governor has only loosened the requirements for restaurants, but we will double check. Anne? Um, just a question, are these um, new things that you're asking the select board to vote, are they gonna be sunsetted or, or are these long-term changes? I believe, um, well, the TIP certification, um, we're asking for that to be a permanent change. Um, the other items, the executive order that gives us the authority to do them um, is a sunset. So um, there is state legislation that's pending that kind of uh, backs up the governor's executive order. And I believe that legislation also sunsets. Um, but as we move forward, you know, people may decide that those are things that could be done permanently. All right. Any other questions? All right, um, so we'll move on to an update about the Small Business Relief Grant Program, which uh, applications program guidelines were posted uh, this past Friday. We're going to be reviewing the first round of applications um, early next week, so the deadline to be considered for that first round of applications is 5 p.m. tomorrow. Um, we've already received several ap applications, which is great from a variety of businesses and all different commercial areas around town. Um, if you're interested in applying for it and if you have any questions, feel free to get in touch with me or Kara um, and try to get your applications in by 5 p.m. tomorrow. Um, and then just a quick recap on the grant. So the town uh, utilized $200,000 of federal community development block grant funding to create the small business um, relief grant program and um, applicants can apply for uh, five to $15,000 grants. And um, there's some criteria that's required because of um, the federal funding source. And then there's some additional town requirements um, and all of that is outlined in, uh, we've got a five page program guidelines, um, which I definitely recommend that I will review before submitting. Um, I'm also going, I see a couple of uh, new attendees in, um, in the meeting today. So just for the benefit of anyone um, who hasn't been here for the past couple of weeks, I'm just gonna pop some additional info in the chat box with links um, and additional information. And the uh, an update, which was included in our business news blast last week, there was a transportation board meeting scheduled for this past Monday, but it was actually rescheduled for this coming Monday. Um, so if you are interested in providing public comment or just listening into the discussion about the extension of the delivery only uh, parking signs, as well as the extended sidewalk um, or open streets concept, uh, in town, in addition to a proposed parking meter rate increase, that's gonna be discussed on Monday. I'm gonna put a link to that agenda in the chat box here. We're also gonna have Todd Kareen on next week at our virtual town hall meeting to give a quick recap if you're not able to attend Monday's transportation board meeting. And since the transportation meeting was postponed and the delivery only parking signs were set to expire uh, this past Tuesday, transportation staff has extended it to June 30th. So. Um, if you have a delivery only parking sign near you, you'll notice that it's been updated with a June 30th deadline. Um, and those are those are all of my updates. So Pat, do you wanna? Yeah, yeah. So uh, in, in public health, we've been really busy um, assisting with the implementation of phase two, and I'll say phase two uh, B, because there's uh, two parts of, of, of the phasing that we've learned through the governor's office. Um, behind the scenes, the health department does an awful lot of activity. We've recently had the high school graduation. Health department provided guidance and assistance with the school department and other other schools to uh, have their graduations comply with the COVID guidelines. In addition, uh, we just had the election. So um, that was a dry run for us, but there was also health and safety uh, protocols that were implemented as part of that. and. 
We've had no um, negative feedback. Everybody worked really hard behind the scenes to make sure it, it ran well. So I, we, the health department thanks everybody for their cooperation. And the town clerk's office worked very hard to work with us to put together the COVID protocols for that event. Um, what's coming up in this phase is um, we are allowed to um, open children's camps with restrictions. So we sent out all our notices with guidance to, to children's camps. Unfortunately, uh, some of the restrictions are are um, causing some of the camps to to reconsider if they're going to be opening opening this year or open later, maybe during phase three uh, or or deeper in, into phase three. Hopefully, they'll have more accommodation. But um, the camp guide restricts the number of uh, campers and 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 does certain health and safety protocols to to make it as safe experience as, as possible so uh if you have inquiries check with your camp to see where they're um what they're going to be doing we have two of our larger camps will be announcing they're going to go virtual they'll be doing virtual camps for their uh, population uh, also, um, swimming pools are, are being approved to open in this phase. So we have about 40, 45 swimming pools and semi-public swimming pools that the health department licenses and oversees uh, as part of the state regulation. And um, they also have COVID restrictions and we'll, we're working with them to open them up and do it safely. Uh, unfortunately, indoor pools still are not allowed until phase three so it's the outdoor pools that are allowed to open during phase one and if the outdoor pool has a, um, a jacuzzi um, that's not allowed at, at this point because of obviously social distancing uh, concerns and uh, the retail stores uh, they've been allowed to to start opening and um, i'm really pleased to to say we've had no calls or issues associated with any anything that has opened so far everybody's doing very good they're doing the best to follow the protocols um, the only calls we've been getting are uh, some businesses misinterpreting the governor's um, and the state's opening protocols where they've um, thought they could open at this phase and we've had to you know educate them on that the other and everybody should be aware of this uh, we've had a couple of calls oh there's somebody in business a or b and they shouldn't be open yet. You know, people are allowed to uh, get their business ready for phase three. And that's when our inspectional staff go out to inquire what's up. That's what we're finding. People are sprucing up their business, knowing that they're going to be available for phase three to do more. And that's when they want to open. And, um, you know, that's perfectly fine. I'd say if you're uh, an establishment that's doing that, put a sign on the window. You know, hope to be opening soon. So, you know, they know you're in there doing whatever you need to do. Um, we mailed out all our notices to all of our uh, food establishments, uh, giving them the information and the protocols that they need to do to uh, open up and, and, and take advantage of the outdoor seating. And as Kara mentioned, um, many departments are involved in that. But uh, that's going to be a streamlined process. The select board will be taking it up tonight. So any businesses that, uh, you know, are concerned or they have any issues, that is a, a, a web meeting. And I believe you can uh, tune in and listen to it. And I believe you can uh, give a comment, um, uh, you know, and, and if, if, if you would like. But I, I will say uh, the select board and everybody is, is conveying support for, for these measures. Um, some of the guidance uh, in the uh, phase approach to allow outdoor seating, I'll just mention some. Number one is you need to have the COVID health and safety plan as part of your, your packet. And that's for all businesses, all retail businesses that are opening. Uh, what we have is you, you go through the checklist of all the uh, social distancing, posting, employee training issues. Um, you check all that, and then when you uh, comply with it, you put in the window, there's a, a sign that says welcome, and that you comply with all the COVID-19 um, protocols established by the uh, Department of Public Health. 
and this shows the customers and um and the inspectional staff in the state if they're in town that you're in compliance so uh, put that in the window we've had some establishments put it in the back uh, where their other licenses are but this is something intended to get the word out that you're up and ready and in compliance so when we see that we we see it and we move on and, and go to the next establishment that doesn't have it um, and, and inquire are they aware of what the protocols are for the outdoor seating um, it's it's the same type of thought process that all of the um, COVID-19 protections have have adopted social distancing uh, worker protection customer protection high level of hygiene high level of cleaning and sanitation all that is put into the guides that we sent out um, and in addition to the guide at the end of uh, the list and if you go online you'll see there's a list of companies that supply the products that you'll need to be doing that so so far that's been going well um, we're hearing uh, establishments are obtaining um, chemicals and face masks those are becoming more um, um, accessible i'm even hearing of prices coming down on face covering so that's that's really good um, <clears throat> And this health and safety plan is something where you need to train your staff so that they are aware of the restrictions and what they should and should not be doing. What, what we're finding is going to be important is posting and, and signs and uh, establishments will be putting, um, they should be putting some signage so that persons walking by this uh, restricted area or this exclusive area for the establishment uh should be reminded to keep distance from that area so that's i think going to be one of our challenges um and i think that's where um as this review process goes through you know we'll be giving hints on on what people can and can't do uh, we have one establishment that uh, read the protocol very thoroughly and he noted that uh, you could put up social barriers so they actually put in temporary barriers and it allowed uh, some closer seating locations. So that's something that is allowed under the protocols. So they went and, and actually got portable plexiglass walls that separate the seats. So um, we'll, that was very um, innovative in, in addressing it. So that can be done. And I suspect um, with weather issues, there may be some inquiries about tents. And that's something that um, you know, the building department and the other departments will be looking at to make sure the tents don't compromise um, pathways of travel and what have you, but it'll give you some weather protection. Um, we also sent something out to all of our restaurants. Um, we uh, received a notice from the Department of um, uh, Environmental uh, Conservation. They were concerned about all the uh, establishments purging their beer. So we included a notice with our restaurant notices, uh, and it's uh, it it should be posted, um, advising how to get rid of stale beer. They were concerned that um, the purging of the beer of all these establishments could impact the sewage treatment plants. So they're promoting to bring it to food recycling facilities where they can use it as part of their uh, food recycling and composting initiatives. So there's a list of places you can bring that to. Um, and that's helpful for some establishments as well as helpful for the environment. So um, beyond that, um, we're busy. We're getting the calls. Uh, we're doing the best we can. We still have other tasks that we have to do within the health department, but we're, we're plugging away. So. Um, so speaking of calls and questions, Pat, we've got a bunch of questions teed up here for you. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a question from Anna Lynn. Two questions. First one, if there's incidents of positive cases among employees, who do we report that to? Yep. Uh, if it, it, part of if it's a food establishment, it's, it's part of their standard protocol. They have to contact the Board of Health. And then our statewide Board of Health system works where that individual, if they're not a Brookline resident and they live in Attleboro or somewhere, um, that Board of Health uh, will be notified when that person gets, uh, if they should go see their physician, if they get tested and they're positive, 
then that triggers a whole uh, chain of communication between uh, the health departments and, and we would advise them of what they need to do. So uh, uh, a person is um, not feeling well, call, call the department. And uh, if you're in a food establishment, ask for your assigned inspector and they'll walk you through it. But that's a great question because this is how we're trying to contain this, uh, this virus. So the quicker we can jump on something, the quicker we can take somebody out of um, uh, the population. Uh, however, that we've had a number of those uh, scenarios play out where the person isn't positive and then they can go right back to work and, and we did the proper public health protection uh, procedures. So that's a good question. Great. Second question, is there guidance about tenant versus landlord responsibility about cleaning? Um, landlord tenant responsibility about cleaning? Um, could they? Yeah. Um, Anna, are you able to chime in here? I'm going to. Is that on a commercial or a residential? And then in what environment of cleaning? Okay. Anna, are you available to clarify? Well, okay. um, I'll, I'll, I'll wing it. Uh, I'll first deal with, because um, we're the code enforcement agency for apartments and condominiums. Um, so uh, it is the property management's responsibility to clean and disinfect high touch areas in um, in buildings where you live. It is the, the occupant's responsibility to clean in, in their unit. The uh, owner isn't obligated to go into their space. Mm -hmm. But uh, in a large condominium building or an apartment building, um, the owner is responsible for, for, for doing uh, uh, that cleaning. We get, uh, we at the early stages of COVID, we were getting assorted calls associated with um, uh, elevators not being cleaned routinely, and we educated the building management that that's one of the things they need to do. That's considered a high touch area that they need to address. I think Anne is on. Yes. Hey, Anne, do you want to repeat your question? Just get a little bit more context for Pat. Yes, I can speak now. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, so I'm renting a space in inside a church, and I'm an after school program, and children has to go through the uh, the lobby area and things like that. And how much of it is my responsibility that I have to clean the lobby area as well as the space that I'm renting, or the church is responsible for, um, cleaning the corridor, um, and I'm cleaning the room, like. It's really hard to know who's responsible for what and the bathroom situation as well, because bathroom is a public. Um, yeah, so if you can give us some guidance about that, that'll be helpful. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming you're a regulated um, daycare type facility? Yes, I'm licensed through okay. EEC. So under your licensing obligation, um, the areas that you are sanctioned to occupy and that the state has approved for you. Yes. Those are your responsibilities. Uh, so you need to ensure that they're clean and sanitized routinely and have frequency. And the e EEC has given good guidance on that. If you don't have their packet, visit their webpage or contact Joyce uh, Stevisak, who's our, our liaison for that, and, and she'll get it to you. Where you have a common area, um, I would have a discussion with your operator to see, you know, the, the, what, what the understanding with your leasing agreement was. But we have some restaurants that have common area bathrooms that they share. And when we give them their license, we say, you, the operator that's getting the permit, are going to be obligated to ensure that it's in compliance with the cleaning and sanitation because you're the one with the license. So, um, we don't license the daycares anymore. We just give guidance to them. So um, I hope that helps. Look at your uh, lease a little closer uh, to see if that's spelled out. Uh, but it's important. The, the, we do want to just make sure cleaning and sanitation is done. And you could call us offline to talk about that a little further if needed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, and I think Pat's answer also maybe addressed the question Susan Silverberg just added specifically about office buildings and landlords responsibility for entry in common areas. So I'm also going to. So there's there's very good guidance for office buildings um, and common area cleaning and sanitation. And a lot of people, you know, the new normal, you'll be seeing signage. You know, in some elevators, you can't do social distancing, so they restrict it. Uh, we're going to be dealing with that when we open up town hall. There's already signage up when we uh, open some of our municipal facilities. So, um, yes, this is something that um, we're trying to get the word out to make sure office buildings who are now opening more with uh, limited capacity need to be hitting those high touch areas and doing cleaning and sanitation. The big question we get is, what's the frequency? How many times a day should they be doing it? And there is no matrix. There is no, oh, this building every hour, every two hours. And I think I've addressed this in past meetings. Um, it depends on your frequency of use. If you have a high frequency of use office building, then we're going to have to clean at a higher frequency rate. If it's a low use, um, then, you know, three times a day is what a protocol that the state has conveyed to us, beginning, midday, and at the end of the day. So, um, Great. Literally, as you were saying the word, the question about frequency, we got a question from Bueller Realty about the frequency of cleaning. So you're doing an amazing job of anticipating people's questions, Pat. Yeah. Um, we're going to move on to a question from Diana at Dream Spa Medical in Coolidge Corner. Um, she asked if there's anything that can be done um, to push their reopening sooner. Um, they're supposed to be part of, of phase two, but cosmetic treatments got pushed back to step two of phase two. Um, they've already rescheduled several, several patients and it's negatively affecting their business. She'd appreciate any advice and um, uh, Diane has already written to Governor Baker. And, and that was going to be my answer, to write to Governor Baker and the opening committee. Um, they, they do accept in uh, input and inquiries um, and, and comments. So it's still live, they're still active. And I think if you have an association of cosmetology, spa entities uh, as a group, communicate with them and tell them that you guys are licensed, you're trained, you know uh, sanitation and cleaning protocols and you know, why not uh, allow it to be open um, sooner? So uh, I think you have good grounds. You, you just got to sell it to them. Great. Um, I'm going to ask, Diana says, thank you for your answer. I'm going to, Roxy, are you available to talk and ask your question? Hi, Roxy. Sure. Hi there. Um, now I'm like, I worded that question so carefully and on my phone, I need to go back and look at what it said. Uh, so, uh, hi, Pat, thanks so much for being here at these meetings. So um, we run an arts enrichment program. We used to do it in partnership with um, Brookline Rec. And so the vast majority of our protocols uh, comply with camp, quote unquote standards, though we're an arts enrichment program and not uh, typically licensed as a camp. Um, so we ran this program, if we ran this program on site, which we're still deciding if it's even remotely economically feasible as most things in the world right now are not, um, we would still aim to follow all the state's distancing and ratio guidance, um, but having an on-site healthcare professional is not feasible as is indicated in the guidelines. Um, you know, I noticed that phase two also allows, I think it's quote arts instruction separately from camp. Um, but really my question is, are, are we still exempt from that or other things that are really designed for a quote unquote camp? Um, and if, you know, we want to follow guidelines, but if there's also, who could we discuss that with? Sure. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, there are a number of programs that are programs, you know, there's um, karate uh, uh, studios and, and, and art studios and, and things of that nature. If you, if you do not call it a camp, 
and it's a structured program, and all your um, promotional literature does not call it a camp, then you can pursue being that summer enrichment program. Um, I, I'm pleased to hear that you'd be following the camp protocols because that's good. That, that's good supervision, and, and 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 there's a lot of good safety elements in there. Um, so it, it can be done. I I would have to revisit. Uh, my mind is more entrenched right now with camps. I'd have to look at what the restrictions, if any, are for a uh, arts program like yours. So why don't you um, uh, call me later today um, at 617-730-2303. Leave a message. And on my machine, I have a number I could get back to you. And we'll just discuss it a little further. But, um, there's a possibility uh, for you. I want to double check what the standard is. But uh, as long as you don't call it a camp, then, um, and it's just a, a straight arts program, uh, we may have possibility for you. Great. Thank you. Okay. So those were all of our questions for Pat. Well, again, very good questions. Um, what we ask everyone is uh, first, you know, read the protocols, read the rules, see what you um, interpret it, and then call us with that particular question. That helps us a lot. It's it's tough when people call us without reading the rules and look for us to give them the guidance because um, we're, we're getting swamped with all these. Um, not to put anybody on the spot, but Caitlin, I see you're here, and it's great you always show up each week. We're still getting the calls, and, and maybe you could just give, because uh, I know we have more people attending today, um, uh, just a quick synopsis. The, the calls we're getting is, what if somebody comes in and says, for a medical reason, I can't wear a face covering? Um, could you just go through that, that uh, scenario again? Sure. Um, so we did put together, our ADA coordinator put together a nice little um, flyer for businesses that I believe, Meredith, you put on the business resource page. It's also on our website, but it's very clear with pictures. Um, if someone comes into your store or restaurant saying that they cannot wear a mask due to a medical reason, you cannot ask them any further questions and you have to find a way to accommodate service to them, whether that's bringing something outside to them, um, get, you know, making sure that they're working with an employee who as, is at a lower risk if you're worried about your employer's safety. Um, you do have to find a way to serve them in some way. Uh, if someone is refusing to wear a mask, you can ask, is it because of a medical reason? If they say yes, the ADA would apply. As I just mentioned, if they say no, it's up to your discretion. But if they do comment that they do have a medical reason, you can't ask them what that medical reason is. You just have to serve them as you would any other customer, but in an alternative way, if that's possible. And and also, um, there there was a I saw on, on the TV or or one of the web. Uh, shows the, uh, yesterday where an, a person approached a, a, an establishment and said for medical reasons they, they couldn't wear the face covering and um, the establishment offered to get the product for them. They said, we'll accommodate you. We will you know, bring it out for you. Um, what, even give us your list and we'll get the thing. So I, I was impressed with that because the worker um, was was aware of accommodations and, and meeting somebody's needs. So I gave them four stars uh, on that. That was that was good. They, they were educated and aware of how to, you know, work with an individual that has a restriction and still get what they need uh, during this time. Yes, and Caitlin, I apologize. I don't think we put the, um, the flyer that you made up on the website, we will do that today. Um, and in the meantime, we did have um, sort of a written explanation of the guidance that Caitlin just provided included in the chat box. Great. Um, and Caitlin, if you have the link to the flyer and want to pop it in the chat box, too, we'll get that on the website. Today. Okay, I'll look for it. Thank Sorry you. Excellent. 
Um, all right, so I, we have a general question from Jen Mason, and I'm putting people on the spot today. Jen, are you available to um, to tell us more about this general question? I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Um, yeah. So I, I just I love this group. I, I've been to almost every single meeting. Um, it's really helped. Um, one of the things I've been doing while we were just the essential business open is working and talking with cheese stores all over the country. We're all in different stages, but it was very, very useful to see how things were trending. And it's how we innovated online classes and our, our telemonger service. And, um, and now I am very excited to have peers like next door and two doors away, but we're so busy. Like I don't have time to go have coffee with, plus there's no place to go have coffee with somebody. Um, for a short time, it would be very useful um, if there was a way for us to generate like just a, like a stock survey um, of what trends other places are seeing. For example, um, we have done well during the um, during the shutdown until Memorial Day. So once the phases started opening, stuff went started going down. And this week, as of phase two, basically I'm at you know um, almost zero. Um, and if I found that all the companies that weren't, hadn't been open, all of a sudden had numbers go up, I would be happily sitting here, letting everybody else get some income in. But if it was happening all over, I'd love to see what those trends are. Um, I have a store at the Boston public market and, um, we could open there, but there is no humans there. So we aren't opening because of that. So there just could be, it could be like a simple, I don't know, under 10 question, just click that you know would be accessible because you're you know we're trying to reinvent ourselves every 48 hours um, and having any income now that we actually have peers here who are new at this and I would love to I think it would be useful for them as well going forward anyways just the thought I, there's smart people in this room and I don't get to be with smart people except I mean I'm with smart people all the time but like this um except for Thursday morning that's it. Just just a thought. I thought Liz Thorpe's uh, or Liz Lender's idea, or no, whoever you know, it was Tiny Hanger. Whoever did the idea to put the signs up was a great idea. So things, magic things happen in this group. Thank you. And the the sign idea was Lucia from Tiny Hanger. Thank you, Lucia. Um, so if anyone has any thoughts. Um, I'll just jump in kind of on behalf of the chamber that um, Chamber of Commerce does have a closed Facebook group page just for businesses. So it's not open to the public um, and that, yeah, Debbie just put it in the chat box. Um, maybe you want to have Debbie speak about this. Where's Debbie? <laughs> sure. Actually, that's, that's a great idea. Um, this idea was born in, in one of these meetings. Um, if you go to the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce Facebook site and then go into groups, you'll see the Brooklyn Business Forum and you can sign up there. And this is um, intended to be a place where people can share information, ask questions, um, just have a conversation with people, make connections. Um, so we're hoping that people are enthusiastic about it. And also I want to um, reiterate for those of you who might not be aware, on the Chamber website, um, there are a couple of possibilities that you can inform the public about how you're in business. One, there's a running um, list of how businesses are operating. And if you send me Debbie at brooklinechamber.com, more information about the name of your business, your website, your phone number, um, an email address and a sentence about how you're doing business, uh, we can get that up there for you. And even more important, what I'd really like to emphasize that people are not taking advantage of, but I think would be a wonderful opportunity, is that if you're a chamber member, you can just log in and put an, um, an opportunity um, on the website that links people immediately to your website. So for example, if Eureka wanted people to go to your website from the chamber, it's like a shop. It's like shopping mall, if you will, on the website. Um, so
So if you're not a chamber member, we hope that you will get in touch with me, Debbie at brooklandchamber.com, and I'll give you a login so you can be on there too. Um, it's a time where we really need to embrace all businesses in Brookline. Um, so if you know of somebody that's looking for more ways to market their business, um, please let them know about this. Thank you, Debbie. David. Hi. Um... Jen, I'm uh, chair of the CCMA, Coolidge Twitter Merchants Association, and also own Eureka Puzzles. One of the things that we've noticed is that, in fact, business has gone down as the state has reopened. You know, we've had some uh, level of business uh, online, and as every single uh, phase so far has come through, uh, we've seen online orders have gone down. Um, some of those things, uh, some of those orders have moved to local pickup right now, but it's clearly as there are more options and the weather is getting nicer uh folks are changing their habits and their buying patterns i would say at this point in time we don't know what's going on you know it's a matter of reinventing the business as you said every 48 hours probably closer to every 12. um and essentially it means sitting in the question for the next number of weeks as um um the general um, business climate unfolds and at the same time does it in a safe way. So, uh, and I'm happy to talk to you. I've uh, been in touch with all of our members and have gotten a sense of how things are going throughout the area and they are um, depressing. But, you know, I think everybody is in this right now and are pulling together. Um, and as we've said many times before, we're all in this together. We're all part of the same ecosystem and trying to figure it out. Absolutely. So I think we're going to transition into, as Raul said in his opening remarks, um, you know, this was a big week in terms of the start of phase two. We've already heard a little bit about how businesses have been impacted and what your experience has been. Um, but, you know, we'd love to hear any more comments, questions from people um, about that, about Jen's idea, or about any other general questions that you might have for staff. So. Feel free to use the Q&A box or raise your hand. Um, it's also exciting to see some new faces in here. Love to see new businesses join. And then, so Debbie has put a lot of very valuable info into the chat, but I think it might have only been directed to the panelists. Um, so I think Debbie's going to re-enter that into the chat for everyone. And while we see if there's a couple more um, questions that come through, I wanted to let everybody know that I think it came through the Coolidge Corner Merchants Association um, was requesting a special guest, um, Abe Faber. <laughs> Many of you know him as a previous owner of Clearflower. Um, some of you may not know that he um, stepped up basically as a volunteer to help um, run the farmer's market um, for the last couple of years. Um, and he has been heroic in keeping the farmer's market going, um, getting services um, so that people can use their SNAP card or, you know, benefits with more farmer's vendors. Um, he's on the front end at the, you know, with the state of developing um, health guidelines during COVID and was, you know, got that to us quickly. Um, and he wants to do it safely. Um, we, what we heard from the Coolidge Corner Emergence, I believe, is um, wanting to have him come and speak to this group um, to kind of hear what he's um, doing, tr tricks of the trade, to help customers be aware of following new rules. Um, it's really hard for humans to get into a new pattern of shopping, having masks on, complying, not touching food, that kind of thing. Um, of course, the farmer's market is on Thursdays, which is the same day is our virtual town hall. Um, he emailed me this morning. He would be, he'll get back to us with probably a different day, not Thursday. Um, and if, so we may do like kind of a, a special, um, a special webinar on a different day and time once he gets back to us with his schedule. Yeah, and I, I'd like to give him a shout out. He did an outstanding job working with us. We worked many months prior to the opening of the farmer's market he was really on the ball with addressing our concerns and I announced, announced that the event was happening and, and a tremendous turnout. Uh, we have a lot of volunteers helping him out with 
the uh, protocols and instructing people and um, they did a great job and I, I see it as a model uh, farmer's market during this uh, challenging time. He did an outstanding job. Great. Um, all right, well, we're not seeing any more questions. I don't see any hands raised. Um, earlier in the call, there was a lot of discussion about outdoor seating and um, Washington Square Tavern was given a shout out and I see they're on today. Um, so if Washington Square Tavern felt like uh, chiming in and talking a little bit about how this past week has gone, we'd love to learn more. Um, uh, but if not, no pressure, just making you aware. No, it's okay. Um, all right, well, I'll, I'll turn it over to Kara to close things out then. Be respectful of everyone's time, we'll end a little early today. Great, so thank you everybody for attending. Um, we will be back here next week um, on Thursday morning. And again, we may have kind of a separate webinar with um, Abe Faber um, to talk about his experience with the farmer's market and how to help customers um, and if any of you have ideas of other topics that um, you'd like to speak about, um, of course, just let us know so we can plan ahead and try to get the right people there. Um, Debbie has put some information in the chat panel. Um, I'm not sure if it's still, yeah, now it's showing up to everybody, I think. Okay, great. We'll leave that open as people leave the meeting. Um, everybody have a good day and Okay, it looks like Washington Square is is live. Yeah. Yay! Yay! Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Yeah. So my first Zoom meeting. Oh, very exciting! Happy to have you aboard. It's quite surreal. <laughs> um, how has this past week been for you guys? Uh, it's been a learning curve. Um, the guidelines from the state were pretty were very good. I talked with Pat yesterday, and. Uh, uh, he went through some of the stuff with us that we'd already done, and uh, I'm 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 very confident that if we're able to keep going and the weather uh, cooperates, we'll we'll be fine. Well, not fine. I mean, this this is a completely un unreal situation. Um, what was we going to say? We my my biggest concern with this whole thing is. Uh, how we're going to be able to work with the town in order to get, because restaurants are unbelievably impacted by COVID. I mean, pretty much most restaurants lost all of March because diners stopped going out. And then basically we've lost April, May, and June. Uh, our, our landlady, Kathy Kenny, let us use the outside of her building to expand our outdoor seating. And we uh, we built partitions so every table is either completely partitioned from the next or six feet apart. Um, yeah, no, my biggest question is for for the group is how can we work with the town to streamline the process of approving? I mean, these are unprecedented times. Approving uh, temporary fix stop gaps so that restaurants and small businesses can survive until things go back to a normal sense. Yeah, um, I think um, you might have missed the first five minutes of our Zoom call, but it's a great question and it's a great way to wrap up. Um, Pat Maloney was also um, talking, I think he's already reviewing your application to change your um, license and um, wanted to let you know that we are going to the select board tonight um, with requests that they can now do because of the governor's order. And what we're, long story short, what we're working towards is that those will be done at a staff level and not even have to go to the select board. Um, and all the abutter notifications for um, restaurants will be waived. There's a lot that's been freed up now with the governor's order and um, the select board will take that up tonight. Um, and on Tuesday, they're going to take up the question, um, which has been recommended by <clears throat> staff from, from our department as well as the police department, and that's to um, no longer require in-person TIP certification. We know that a lot of you are needing to hire new staff, you know, as they circulate, and the last thing you need is, is hurdles to jump through. So we um, 
by Tuesday of next week, there will be um, significantly streamlined of everything, but for you specifically, um, maybe Pat could jump in, but I believe staff are already reviewing your application. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Yeah, but, and, and I would urge to listen to tonight's um, select board hearing and also participate. They need to hear, just as you mentioned, the, uh, the industry impact so they understand that these decisions and these votes are, are necessary to, to get everybody back on board as best we can. You know, you just outlined four months uh, where, you know, no, nothing going on for you. So uh, I think um, I'm hoping some operators participate and take advantage of the, um, the session with the select board tonight. It'll also be on, on, on the web and, um, you know, explain to them. Uh, but they are they are receptive, and and Kara knows they've been communicating with us. Uh, they want to support business, so uh, but hearing from you is is it helps too. Awesome, thank you. And so I did. Um, there were references to a couple of different things at the select board meeting tonight. Um, who to contact regarding questions with outdoor seating, and so I did pop some information in the chat box too. So I'll. Um, leave the meeting open for a couple minutes in case people just want to scroll through and and click those links. Um, Meredith, I just want to let I just want to let people know from uh, Big tonight we have two meetings at the same time. So we have the regularly scheduled school committee meeting, which will be on the municipal channels, and then we have to move the select board to our secondary live stream, uh, which we only in the last month have have set up because we do have some meetings that run simultaneously. So if you have any trouble finding the stream, just go to Brookline Interactive Group and click on the Watch and Explore tab, and you'll be able to find both streams there. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kathy. And Kathy, and thank you so much again um, for everything that Brookline Interactive Group has been doing over the past three months. It's been incredibly helpful and very valuable to the community. So thank you. Thank you. Wonderful to be in partnership with you. Yes. All right. I think that's really the end. Washington Square Tavern, thank you for joining. We hope you'll come back for um, subsequent virtual town hall meetings, which will be every Thursday at 9 a.m. for the foreseeable future. Thank you very much. So, yeah. All right. Have a great week. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Yeah. For those that are still on, um, you can email um, the board meeting tonight. It's going to be very late. It's the last agenda item. Um, I'm going to put in here Devin Williams' email address. You can um, anybody here can request to speak during um, public comment, which is at the very beginning of the meeting. Um, they usually don't like the comment to be about something that's on the agenda, but just just give it a try so you can say your piece and go. Um, so we'll put Devin Williams' email in this chat box, um, and that way you guys can get on with your business tonight. Thanks. Thank you.